This is Mr. Douglas welcoming you to Open Mic on KGPR. Now bring up the most interesting man in the world, and everybody knows who you're talking about. Jonathan Goldsmith has appeared in hundreds of TV shows and movies, but he's mostly known for his appearances in the Dos Equis beer commercials. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Oh, pretty good. Uh, where are yeah. you at today? Well, I'm at my home in Vermont. At your home in Vermont. Yep. I'm I'm in the big, great state of Montana. <laughs> I know I know the state fairly well. I spent a lot of a lot of time in my youth trout fishing out there. Oh, nice. Any particular areas that you were? From? Yeah, we were we were stationed uh, mostly about around Butte, and then hit the Jackson uh, Big Hole and. I think the snake too, if I remember correctly. Uh, Madison, we did some floating uh, trips, and a wonderful place called Wise Lake. Are you familiar with that at all? Uh, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the lake. I'm familiar with the other places you just. You know, uh, yeah, I'm, I was living in California, and my dad uh, was in New York, and we'd meet there, spend a week fishing together and it was it was wonderful. I had a great time. The doctor that delivered me lived in Butte a long time ago. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. Well, that's pretty neat. I mean do you ever make it out here, um I guess No, I, I haven't. One of the reasons I moved one of the many reasons I moved to Vermont is that we have marvelous fishing here. It's it's quite different than the majesty of the West. It's a little more uh it's a little gentler. It's a little smaller on every scale, including the fish. <laughs> but it, 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 it's nice, and I love uh, I love the Green Mountains where I am. It's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And uh, odd that banana belt area, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I've got two little boys, a, f a five-year-old and a three-year-old, so it's really nice to expose them and get them out fishing. And uh, uh, geez, that's wonderful. We try Are you a hunter? Are you a hunter too? Yeah. I used to be. I used to be when I was, I guess, probably your age. You sound like you're in late 30s, right? You're pretty good. I'm 37. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I I used to hunt a lot of birds. Oh, nice. And I yeah, I raised German short hairs for a while, and then uh, one day I brought in a brace of pheasants, and my little boy was three at the time, and uh, he said, "Daddy, wake the birdies up." And that was the last day I ever went hunting in my life. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't. I couldn't explain to him, you know. Right now, I mean, you're part of such a unique ad campaign that there have been. I mean, there have been a few like this. I mean, you could virtually go up to anyone and bring up the Dos Equis guy, and they'll no doubt be able to to quote something from it. I mean, talk about being the face of this uh, this crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's an ad, but at the same time, it's like a cultural phenomenon. It's it's been amazing. This is the sound of knocking wood right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a very lucky guy. I'm not uh, 45 years old. I'm 73. Yeah. Most guys my age are in the twilight of their career. Mine has just become meteoric. <laughs> so I'm very lucky. Well, I mean, tell tell me how did how did you get involved in sure. commercials? And and um, I don't know. Do you find yourself laughing at them when they hear? Uh, well, I do, and that's the beautiful thing about it. I'll, I'll answer both questions, but people frequently say you find yourself laughing to other people laugh. I think that's one of the nicest things about this. It makes people smile. Yeah, but I got this. Uh, I went out seven, almost seven years ago, six and a half years ago, on a, a cattle call for an a commercial, and all I knew was that they were looking for an actor that had improvisational skills, how to do an improvisation, and end up with a tagline, and that's how I um, wrestled Fidel Castro. That's fine. All right. So I went down, and there must have been 500 people at this open, what we call a cattle call, and uh, I said, Jesus, my agent, who's now my wife, I said, she's made a ridiculous mistake. I look, everybody else looked like Juan Valdez, the coffee guy, in that great commercial campaign. They were looking. I said, they're looking for a Latino. And uh, anyway, I went in. I was loose as a goose because I didn't think I had a chance whatsoever. My car was parked illegally. I hope you're taping this, or am I talking too fast? No, I'm not taping it. <laughs> Uh, all right, when you want me to slow down or anything, you just let me know. You're fine. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, great. So 
So my car was parked illegally, and at 4 o'clock they were going to tow it, and I'd get a huge fine. So, Jesus, I just rambled on through my stream of consciousness. I spent half my youth in fantasy anyway at the Abercrombie Gun uh, sh- uh, show shop on uh, in New York City. I just used to hang around there and dream of African safaris and 500 nitro express elephant guns and the rest. And I started this stream about the guns and the high, uh, the Sierra Madre, how I met Che Guevara, and I screwed his wife. And, uh, then Fidel Castro heard that I was, uh, you know, a famous lover and a chess player, and we met in a, in a, in a cave in the Monte Grasso. I don't even know if there is a Monte Grasso. I just kept spinning this wild-ass tale, and they let me go on and on, and I'd hear some laughter. The director was in New York, and I'm sitting in the empty studio in California, and I got out of the interview. It took 45 minutes. I didn't get towed away, and I called Barbara. I said, this was a massive waste of time, but thanks, and I started to say to myself, God, she's cute, but what a waste of a stupid interview. They're not looking for me. She says, don't be so smart. They're looking for an actor with some improvisational skills, as I mentioned. And a month later, my God, we heard about him again, heard from him. And this time, oh, there was very little competition. There were only about 200 people. Same thing went on. And uh, then they went on a worldwide search. They All of the domestic uh, meccas for uh, commercial casting, New York, Chicago, uh, I think Dallas, and also Buenos Aires and Mexico City. Well, they didn't get the Latino that they wanted. They got a Jew from New York <laughs> and that most people are convinced is a Latino. I, I lived at the time on a sailboat, and I was the only guy on the dock that cleaned his own boat and did his own woodwork, bright work. And the other Mexican guys thought that I was Mexican, too, (laughs) which which is the highest compliment. But after another two months of their international search, I said, oh, there's not a chance. They called me in, and there were only two other fellows and myself, and we screen tested in full makeup and wardrobe, and I got it. And, you know, we just thought, well, I'll get a cycle of 13, 14 weeks, and that's great. And then it just it just took off like a, a spaceship, and it's absolutely changed my life. I had been a journeyman actor for 50 years, almost to the time, and I started when I was 20, 19 or 20. I'm 73, and uh, it's just changed my life. I did star in over 350 shows, and nobody knew who I was. You know, I'd get a look once in a while, and they would thought that I was Bruce Dern or somebody else. And now it's everything I ever had hoped for or dreamed about. I mean, I've recognized constantly. One of the reasons I left California was I, I was just inundated with, you know, nice people that were kind enough to recognize, appreciate the campaign, and not leave me alone. So... Now, now we moved to Vermont, and it's happening again. <laughs> so, <Get away. laughs> yeah. no, we can't. We try to sneak off to New York City for a weekend. And I, I go through the streets, and you know, these construction. Hey, yo, drink it up, those sackies. These construction guys, you know. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. And the demographics, which is incredible, is I, I was sitting in a little Mexican place in L.A. where my wife and I would go for a quiet breakfast, and a fellow comes over, and she's, he says, is that? And my wife says, yes, it's him. He said, you know, I was asking my son yesterday, who's seven, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, I want to be the most interesting man in the world. And then two weeks, two weeks later, we're on a bus in uh, Manhattan, and an old gentleman's getting off uh, the bus, and he's does a double take, he sees me, he comes over and he taps me on the shoulder with his cane. And it's not often that 73 I'm called Sonny, but he said, Sonny, when I come back, I want to be you. <laughs> that pleases the hell out of me, you know? 
and we get we get calls from all kinds of people from fraternities that want me to come from uh, book publishers. Uh, it's just opened a world, Patrick, for me that was always closed. <laughs> And it gets better every single day. I just had pictures taken with the President of the United States. <laughs> yeah. So. And it's, it's all weird because it's, it's a it's an ad campaign for for, for a, beer, a beer, and it's real quick, thirty seconds or or even less sometimes, and uh, yeah, and uh, it has that kind of impact. So that's 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 the perfect ad campaign. It worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you can see it in in the statistics in a down beer year. I think Chicago last year was up 37%. I remember because they we saw some ad some things in Ad Magazine and um Ad Week and stuff like that. But uh, Dos Equis is apparently the number one Mexican import now. And that's amazing because it was a very small company and and a couple of weeks ago, um, and I'm sure my press agent can give it to you so you get it right, but it seems like Dos Equis is holding up Heineken's, which it owns. <laughs> so that's nice. Heineken's is now bringing in James Bond. Did you know that? He's gonna. He's coming in. Uh, Clyde, what's his name? Daniel Craig. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in good company. Well, now you've talked about you know you're fishing, you're hunting, you're you yeah. lived on a boat. I mean, obviously this this question kind of uh, answers itself a little bit. But I mean, are you the adventurous type in your in your personal life? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I've been fortunate enough in two different circumstances to save two lives. I've been a mountain, not a not a rope and python and all that, but I've been a, a, a hiker, mountain hiker, and traveled all through the Caribbean in my sailboat. I've lived on and off sailboats for 35, 36 years. Been caught in some pretty bad storms. I've uh, been in the back country uh, in Mexico, uh, throughout uh, the Caribbean, as well as here in the Sierras, or in California in the Sierras, and um, almost mostly the Sierras, a little bit in the Sequoias. Climbed some of some mountains, Mount Whitney, which at the time was the highest mountain they thought in the lower 48 outside of Alaska, Mount McKinley. And then they found a mountain in uh, Nevada in the White Mountains that was four feet tall or so. I couldn't claim. But that was an e that was an easy hike. But on that on that hike, we saved a guy's life who was lost in a snowstorm. So I've had a I've had a terrific. Terrific run. <laughs> yeah, but do you bowl overhand yeah. in real life? <laughs> sure. Is there, I didn't know any any other way to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny too. It, it it's such a great character. I know that you know there was recently a couple of years ago an attempt to convert the Geico caveman into a TV show because they were so popular. I know. Has there been yeah. any discussions to expand this this character into like television or? Yeah. Lots of discussions, but it's it's not time now. It's just not time. The the run gets better and better. The 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 numbers go up and up. That can come later. But they, Gosecki's, uh, very wisely, I think, wants to just keep this campaign as it is. We've had book deals thrown at us. A uh, major company wanted to do a feature film, and right now we don't have to do that. There'll be time for that later, I think. I hope. You know. <laughs> And I say it's a funny business. Sometimes when you when it's over, it's over. So it's a hell of a run, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. I've been thinking lately that because they've been talking about this uh, Anchorman too. I've been thinking he, this character would be an awesome long lost dad to Ron Burgundy in that series. <laughs> yeah, and how? And there's, but there's a lot of reality stuff that, that's being pitched, and uh, you know, there's time for that. It's not. It's not now. Right. Not now. Mm-hmm. You were mentioning you've been involved in so many TV shows and, and, and films over the years, so many westerns. You've played with guys like you know John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. Do, do yep. you, you know, being recognized for the Dos Equis guy um, more than anything else, does that uh, – how do you feel about that as far as you've well, so much – I, 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 I wish that it had come 40 years ago, you know. It, it, but it did, it's a little bittersweet in a way. I mean, I struggled. I did all right. You know, I was a journeyman actor. I never made the leap into uh, 
uh, feature films, really. Uh, you know, I did Hang 'em High and The Shooters, but and The Shooters was a small part. But I never made the leap. They thought that in 1977 I did a picture called Go Tell the Spartans, and I starred opposite Burt Lancaster. And we got, it was a small film. It showed uh, uh, us in league with the corrupt government of South uh, Vietnam. So we never got any help from the government <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, Lancaster financed half of the picture out of his own pocket. We got rave reviews for the most part. I got the best review an actor could ever hope for. The New York City News said uh, Academy uh, quality performance, Academy Award quality performance, and it didn't work. For six months after the picture opened, we were buried by Apocalypse Now. So I wish, because, you know, it could have happened for me uh, years ago, but it didn't. But at least it did happen. There are so many people that are very talented and a major contribution and it they quit you know the timing is just not right for whatever they present and uh, I once had the Hollywood uh, he was called the Hollywood reporter his name was Vernon Scott and I used to go to the gym every day he was one of the regulars he says kid he says you got a lot of talent he says that's not enough you got to outlast the bastards <laughs> and and there was a lot to that because there were some rough times. I left the business for a period of ten years. Started a started a commercial business and uh, found that I was very successful at it. And licensed thirty five foreign countries. Traveled around the world. Had a Lon an office in London. But came back because that was always what I wanted to do. It was my first love. I felt that something was unfulfilled and I didn't want I would rather not be financially rewarded as much as I wanted to be emotionally re rewarded so I came back and uh, so it's 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 very very much appreciated uh, it's it's a wonderful feeling and now I've always been involved, and I'd like to speak about it if I can, uh, with abused children. Since I've been 18, I've been involved with handicapped and kids at risk, and that's perhaps the very best thing. I'm frequently asked on red carpets, "What's the best thing about this celebrity status?" And I said, "It's to call attention to the things that are really important to you." I never had that platform before. I mean, I used to go out in, in the streets in, in a clown costume and paint, face paint kids to, you know, for, for a buck or two to call attention to child abuse. And I joined an organization uh, almost 40 years ago called Free Arts for Abused Children. And all volunteers, some big name people, and uh, we would go into institutions where kids were under lock and key protection from their own parents or prisons where I taught. And uh, it just made a tremendous a difference as far as being able to be a fundraiser. I, I just made an appearance for somebody and uh, got a nice salary and a piece of that was given directly to the organization. So that's important. That's an important part of my life. It can be looked up at uh, freearts.org. You, you mentioned you took off for 10 years and you, you traveled mm -hmm. the world and stuff, and, and it seems to mm -hmm. kind of neat that, uh, you know, you, you were able to become, the, you know, a very adventurous guy and, uh, and and land this role in in, a, in some weird way by uh, taking time off from acting and, and living life around the world. <laughs> well, you, you know, my wife was very instrumental really in a way in helping me get this because the casting people called her she was my agent as i mentioned and they said you know we really like him but we're thinking of going a little bit younger and my wife said how can you have the most interesting person in the world who doesn't have life experience which takes time they called back 15 minutes later and we screen tested <laughs> so you know you can't you, you got to live the life to have the life well, and, and Hollywood has 
definitely changed quite a bit through the years. And, and oh God, yes. What was it like being a part of that golden era of westerns in the '60s and, and early '70s in both film and television? Well, it was kind of rough on my ass because New York guys don't spend too much time on horses. <laughs> I fell off of more horses than <laughs> I can possibly tell you. I, I did, but it, it was wonderfully, it was a wonderful time. It was the golden age of television. I mean, think about some of the great shows, Gunsmoke. I did, six, I think, 15 or 16 of them. I did so many of them, and they liked me, thank God, that they said, geez, we'd love to use you, but you're too recognizable. I went out and dyed my hair blonde. <laughs> you were in that original Dallas series. I mean, what do you think of that yeah. coming back? I thought that that was great. That was wonderful, I have. Some people that I've maintained, I've maintained friends with. Um, that one went off the air, what, 20 years ago? God, At least. <laughs> uh, 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 just amazing. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. I played a couple of different roles. I played a drug dealer and on for uh, in one year, and then uh, a year or so after that, I played a producer, an agent that became a producer for uh, Linda Gray. That's when Jr. was screwing around with uh, the Valentine girl. You probably don't even remember it, but she wanted her, she wanted her out of town, away from Jr. So I found her a great movie uh, that took place in a hot tub in, in Japan or something, and she left Dallas. So. But that was fun. I enjoyed that very much. My favorite actors that I've worked with, <coughs> James Garner goes right to the top of the list. I, I did a lot of uh, uh, Rockford Files. Uh, he's just a, a beautiful guy. Uh, Henry Fonda, I did his show, a TV show where I think it was, he played Inspector Smith or something. He was a cop. I was a young actor at the time and had him on the stand in the courtroom, and he just let me have the whole scene. And one day we were sitting and uh, kind of just talking and, going over our lines a little bit and I said he asked me how it was going I said well you know it's it's one little it's like one stone falling at a time I never know when the next job's going to come he says kid it's been like that with me all my life <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was a gem and Burt Lancaster was extremely exciting to work with he was a complex man a terrific actor I enjoyed him very much. I worked with Glenn Ford and uh, learned something from him that uh, I never forgot. Uh, you start the scene right before the, uh, the director says action. You should be in motion emotionally, sensually, in every other way so that it's the camera's picking it up. It doesn't start when you say action. He was, he was wonderful. I thought Clint Eastwood was a, a terrific gentleman and uh, a concerned concerned man. And uh, at the time, I thought he was just a lovely guy, and he's turned into an incredible talent. Just, just I'm sure it was always there, but it, it never manifested itself until his later years. And he's absolutely inspirational, and he's a great director and a fine actor. And who am I? My all-time favorite woman that I've ever worked with is Joan Fontaine, Olivia de Havilland's sister. A beautiful, gracious, charming woman. I starred in something called The Star, a two-part canon. Uh, crazy, it was crazy about Donna Mills. I was for a while. I was on uh, Knots Landing. Uh, I was on Dynasty as well for a little while, a short run. And that was interesting. Um, I'll let you talk, Patrick. Don't <laughs> no, this ask is great. me a question. Hey, hey, this is why we're talking. I like you know, I'm okay. picking your brain and, uh, and living through you. <laughs> oh, okay, lighting the pipe again. Think of a good question here. <laughs> Well, let's talk about. I mean, you've you've mentioned you know how you had like duplicate roles on 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 series like um, Gunsmoke or Bonanza or yeah, and, and it's funny because you'll you'll you know when you get to a point where you're watching that kind of stuff every day, you might look and go, hey, that's the guy who died in yesterday's episode, and he's a different character, and yeah, and it goes back to theater because you'll watch you know obviously you watch theater and guys go backstage and 
change their clothes yep. and come out the same guy. I mean, talk about yeah. the fun in that um, as an actor where, you know, one day you're playing the, you know, the thug that goes and robs the coach, and then the next day you're playing the friend of the main character. And, and uh, yeah, just how, how fun is that being able to just play different parts on a big time show? Well, it, it's wonderful because that's what it, that's what's exciting and challenging to an actor. You know, it's, you have many different facets, most people, to their personalities. You've got a dark side. I like to think that I'm much better at comedy, and I seldom ever got a chance to do it. I did play Dracula opposite uh, Jack Elam, who was uh, Frankenstein on a short-lived show called Stuck, Struck by Lightning. But my career, uh, the Hollywood Reporter wrote an article on me, uh, dying is a good living. I got killed all the time. It depressed the shit out of my father. I was taken out in a buckboard, drowned on the streets of San Francisco, hung by Joseph Cotton, uh, machine gunned, poisoned, garroted, ice picked to death. I played mostly bad guys because I think, and people ask me how come, I think because I didn't look like a bad guy. I didn't tip off the story. But I certainly had enough stuff to call upon inside of me and apparently did well playing a bad guy. But it was wonderful. I started off in my first year uh, with the biggest names in the theater, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, William Inge, and Ilya Kazan. My first year as an actor on Broadway and off-Broadway. And from that auspicious beginning, I came to California and drove a garbage truck for six months. So, but that's the exciting, one of the exciting things of being an actor, to be able to explore those differences and play those different roles. And uh, I used to teach a lot in, in prisons for youth. And I learned a tremendous amount about acting and uh, that's one of the things that I try to bring across to these kids, that that just because they are in one jig, in this case they were incarcerated, so they were certainly in one position, one place geographically, but they did not have to be there spiritually and uh, emotionally. They could take themselves and transport themselves through the use of their imagination and you know, they, they can transcend walls and, and a cage that they were locked up. In. The, the exploration has been a lifelong, I've always been a seeker. I mean, the wonders of the mind and the possibilities of that can happen and what one can do when they're under uh, hypnosis, for instance. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that it's drawn me to the outs outdoors, to be able to get out under the stars, and I used to camp out tremendously, drove down to Baja, Cala, through Baja, before there was a road in the late 60s, I guess, or if there was a road, you couldn't see it, you know, it was, but it's, it's that wonder that goes along kind of with your question about exploring, exploration of the different facets of whatever your experience is to draw upon as an actor and hopefully portray it. And if you're a little psycho, a little bit screwed up, it doesn't hurt either. Yeah. None of that hurts. It's your life experience that, that gives you the dimensions and the nuances to who and what and how you present yourself. So thanks to a psychiatrist, truly I became an actor, but that's another story. You know, you're kind of responsible for the direction that your life and your career goes. And when I was younger, I had to take just about everything and, and, and the offer that went with it. And that's why I did a lot of stuff that I would never in a million years do now. I mean, some of the stupidest people. I did a, oh, God, I did a show called Manimal. Do you ever remember it? No. <laughs> uh, oh, it's oh, so terrible. Oh, some other one with a wonderful actor by the name of Roddy McDowell. And <laughs> just to tell you how absurd it can be, I, I played some high priest to, to some gorgeous young queen or whatever, and 
in the morning uh, I had ordered that we throw her son into the fire pit. So she's gazing into the fire pit the night before we kill her son. And I come up to her and I say, Princess, you look troubled. You look troubled. <laughs> you look troubled. We're going to kill her son. Yeah, we're giving the son to the fire god. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It's been an interesting career. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I do appreciate visiting with you, and uh, this has been a, a great pleasure to to. Uh, talk oh, it's about my movies. pleasure. So. You you made it easy. You made it <laughs> real easy. Oh yeah. We'd like to thank Jonathan Goldsmith, also known as the Dos Equis Man, for joining us today on the program. My name is Mr. Douglas, inviting you to join us next Tuesday at 1:30 for Open Mic, our weekly program featuring local and not so local artists. If you'd like to be a guest on Open Mic, send us an email at kgpr at msugf.edu, or you may call us at 268-3739. Thank you for listening and supporting Montana Public Radio, 89.9 FM, KGPR, Great Falls.